Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. My name is Dalvar Rohaj, and I'm a senior fellow with AEI's Foreign and Defense Group and a co-host of the Eastern Front, a podcast dedicated to security challenges running uh, along the line uh, from, from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea and to, uh, dedicated to why those matter to the United States. My role tonight is to serve as a very inadequate substitute for AEI's uh, Director of Foreign and Defense Policy, um, Cory Shaki, who was initially supposed to host this very special event. I should say that this conversation is co-hosted jointly with our friends at the International Republican Institute, and I want to thank the IRI team, particularly IRI's Vice President for External Affairs, Antonia Ferrier, who is joining us on stage for teaming up with us and for putting uh, this, this special event up. Uh, it really is an extraordinary honor to welcome Svetlana Tsikhanouskaya to AEI. Um, Mrs. Tsikhanouskaya is the president of the Coordination Council of Belarus and the head of Belarus's United Transitional Cabinet, currently operating from exile in Vilnius, Lithuania. And most importantly, she is a living, breathing embodiment of values that we cherish so much at AEI and at IRI. As somebody um, who was born in what was then Czechoslovakia, you won't be surprised to hear that I have a big poster of Václav Havel in my office, a dissident playwright who displayed an enormous courage of convictions and spent a fair share of his time in communist prisons and was later catapulted by events in 1989 into the presidency of a free Czechoslovakia and later the Czech Republic. Similarly, Mrs. Tsikhanouskaya never sought a life in politics, born in a small town into a working class family, worked as an English teacher, spent a fair amount of time as a full-time mom, taking care and homeschooling a son with special needs. Yet over the course of the past couple of years, she has been presented with daunting life choices and in confronting them, she has displayed more courage than most people do in their lifetime. When her husband, Sarhei Sihanouski, activist and YouTuber, uh, who will have been exposing the rotten nature of Lukashenko's regime, announced his presidential run, uh, he was thrown into jail, where he is to this day. And I think for most of us, that would be enough to dissuade us from sticking our heads too much. Uh, but Mrs. Tsikhanouska instead decided to run for presidency in his stead. And by any fair account, she won that race in August 2020 with uh, possibly as much as 75% of the vote. The rest is history, including the Kremlin-sponsored crackdown on Belarusian opposition and the creeping absorption of Lukashenko's Belarus into Russia. But the story is not over yet. Thanks to partly the heroism of people of Ukraine who have exposed the much-feared Russian military as a hollow, rotten shell, and also thanks to the courage of Mrs. Tsikhanouskaya and her colleagues and uh, Belarusian activists who are fighting every day for a return of democracy and rule of law to Belarus. Again, what an honor to have you at AEI. Um, just a very quick housekeeping announcement. What we are going to do with, with Antonia is to let Ms. Tsikhanouskaya speak for, for, for a bit, offer some initial thoughts, then we'll open it up for a, for a little conversation. And towards the end, we'll bring in the audience as well, uh, both our in-person audience and our online audience. If you are uh, watching the, the live stream, you can already email your questions to my colleague Ben Lefkowitz. Uh, the email is in the, on, the, on the event uh, webpage, and I'm told I'll see it on uh, some, some, some sophisticated iPad-like contraption later on. Uh, again, thank you all for joining us. And Antonia, now over to you. Good evening. Um, I'm honored here to be here at AEI. Uh, this is an organization I respect for the caliber of its work and the quality of its scholars. Thank you, Dalibor. 
Uh, I really can't think of another organization in Washington, I know many, that really the caliber of its work is as high and as esteemable as what we have here at AEI, so thank you. I'm also honored to be Vice President of External Affairs at the International Republican Institute because I'm privileged to have the opportunity to work with such incredible individuals like my colleagues in our Eurasia division, notably including Steve Nix, who is here and in many ways has been so much part of the Belarus team and the fight for freedom in Belarus. Without him, we wouldn't be here today with Svetlana. So thank you, Steve. Thank you to our colleagues in our Eurasia division. Svetlana, I am going to call you Madam President because you would be president if not for Viktor Lukashenko, who stole the election from you. I'm going to keep my remarks really at that because we are here to hear you. So with that, Madam President, thank you. So good evening, dear friends. It's a real honor for me to speak with you today at the American Enterprise Institute. I would like to express my gratitude to Steve Nix and the entire International Republican uh, Institute for their steadfast support of democratic Belarus. In 2020, the people of Belarus attempted to regain their right to freely elect their own government, a right that is guaranteed to all democratic nations. However, this right was taken away from Belarusians by a dictator 29 years ago with the support of Russia. In the West, Lukashenko is referred to as Europe's last dictator, which he considers as compliment. In 2020, millions of Belarusians desired a new direction. As the country was stagnant, the economy was deteriorating, and Lukashenko had a pl no plan or vision for our future. The people yearned for a fresh start. My husband, Sergei Tikhanovsky, was one of the candidates. He was a popular blogger and a YouTuber who had been criticizing the government for years. Lukashenko was frightened of Sergei's popularity, so uh, regime arrested him to prevent from regis registering as a candidate. As Sergei's wife, I took his place. Lukashenko sneered and claimed that the Constitution is not for women, thinking that my candidacy was so absurd that he permitted me, permitted me to register as a presidential candidate. This is how I became a politician. It wasn't ambition that compelled me, but love to my husband and to my country. Therefore, I was the sole opposition candidate who competed against Lukashenko. When Belarusians voted for me, they voted him out. I won the election. Even though they attempted to rig it in the dictator's favor, I had won. Freedom to choose a new democratic direction had won. But Lukashenko and his corrupt regime stole the election. When Belarusians took to the streets to defend their choice, the regime unleashed its terror squads. The police killed people. Tens of thousands were arrested, beaten, and detained. Many are still in prison. I was threatened, and so were my children. With Sergei in jail, they needed one parent to keep them safe from harm. I made this difficult decision to leave our beloved Belarus. To avoid persecution, many Belarusians did the same. This was just the beginning of deep political and humanitarian crisis in Belarus that still exists and worsens with each passing day. The repressions that began in 2020 have continued. Every day, approximately 17 people are arrested on political charges. But still, Belarusian battle the regime in numerous ways. We will never surrender. 
The regime should speak with his own people to resolve crisis. But what does this disgraced and paranoid, paranoid ex-president do? He turns to Russia and Putin's awful ambitions. In 2022, when Russia started the war against Ukraine, the first attacks came from, from Belarusian soil. Last year, Russia launched more than 1,000 missiles from our territory. This means that Lukashenko violated international treaties and was Putin's enabler from the outset. Launching a war of aggression with undoubtedly result in uh, Putin appearing before the Hague Tribunal. Lukashenko must join him. He is now a war criminal, like just his master. And now, just as Belarusians worldwide were celebrating Freedom Day, Lukashenko was signing away more of our serenity by allowing the Russians to build nuclear missile silos in our soil. It's now evident that more than our future is at stake. Lukashenko is helping Russia in taking Europe to the brink of nuclear war. Unlike Lukashenko, 86% of Belarusians are against the war. We have partisans sabotaging the railways, cyber partisans attacking state infrastructure, and citizen journalists disseminating honest news and countering regime propaganda through leaflets. Brave Belarusians pay a high price for... Uh, uh, brave Belarusians uh, pay high price even for small acts of uh, resistance. Arrest, torture, and long prison terms await them. But they never give up. They are my inspiration. And so are the more than 1,450 political prisoners in Belarus. Alex Belyatsky, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, has been fighting against this terrible regime for decades and he is an inspiration to the world. We have families torn apart, such as Igor and Daria Losik, both in jail. Igor received 15 years for writing a blog, and his wife Daria received two years for defending his, his, her husband in public. Their children are now being cared for by their grandparents. Prison conditions are so terrible that Igor attempted to take his own life. While the immoral regime laughs in the face of such suffering, I'm happy to say that Igor survived. He has now been placed in solitary confinement. His daughter, Paulinka, has just turned four years old. This barbarism has resulted in the largest talent train in Belarusian history. Lukashenko has driven away the brightest and best, including doctors, IT specialists, entrepreneurs, uh, politicians, uh, artists, and uh, sports stars. Like the rest of us, they are heartbroken that their future is being stolen and sold so that the two tyrants can enjoy their criminal gains. Dear friends, now what we are witnessing in Belarus is the reconstruction of a Russia-sponsored totalitarian regime in European country. With its 20th century KGB and 19th century Gulags, Belarus may end up far worse than it was during the communist era. The old communists lied and believed their lies. The new totalitarians know they are lying and don't care. There is no justice in Belarus because the justice system has been corrupted by the tyrant. There is no truth in Belarus because Lukashenko speaks and his minions do his bidding. It is cynical, inhuman, and utterly immoral. When Ukraine wins this war, the totalitarian states, Belarus and Russia, will fall. The dictators will be gone, and together we can begin to rebuild. We need your assistance, leaders of the great Western democracies, to accomplish this. And while Ukraine is winning this war, I must remind you not to put Belarus off until another day. We need to increase sanctions and tighten any that already exist. We must investigate any sanctions busting and close any loopholes tightly. We must delegitimize Lukashenko more and more. You should officially recognize Belarusian democratic structures, such as United Transitional Cabinet and the Coordination Council. 
because these are the genuine representatives of the Belarusian people. A free and democratic Belarus is the ultimate sanction on Russia's sick imperial fantasies. But if we don't win now, then Europe will not be free and the Iron Curtain will fall once more. Look at Moldova and Georgia. Russia will not stop. It's in our interest, America's interest, and the world's interest to end it as soon as possible. Poland understands this, as do our Baltic friends. You know precisely what happens in Europe when dictators are appeased. America sacrifice its global reputation as a true and trusted friend was born on the battlefields of Europe. The future of Europe is being decided in Ukraine and Belarus. Our fates are intertwined. Supporting democratic Ukraine means supporting democratic and independent Belarus, and vice versa. The hundreds of brave Belarusians fighting on the front line of the war are proof of this fact. And this is what I plead for today. So glory to Ukraine and long live Belarus. Thank you. I guess I get to ask you the first question. You laid out a very dire picture. You are living in exile in Lithuania. You have your children. How do you stay hopeful? How do you keep your chin up every day and fight the fight? You know, uh, there wasn't uh, a single day since 2020 then that uh, I felt fear, that I was scared for my husband, for my children, for my family, for people of Belarus. And, uh, and there was no one day when I didn't feel anger with what's going on with uh, my country, with people who are being tortured in jails, with thousands of splitted families. And this anger transfers into energy. I understand that I have no other way out of this situation only to uh, continue this fight. When I wake up every morning and when I'm, for example, exhausted, I think that I can't do this anymore. I'm too tired because it's a really, really tough fight. You think about every person in jail who doesn't have opportunity to drink a cup of coffee, to take a shower, who are humiliated physically and morally every day, who are being tortured, who have to cut their veins you know, to uh, avoid punishment cells, you know, to fight even from inside uh, the jail. And you tell yourself, you have to wake up, go and fight because you are responsible for people in Belarus, not only we, but also other people who, uh, who now fight. And, and uh, you don't have right to give up. You, how are you going to look into your children's eyes who are asking every day, when are we going to see our daddy? I understand that I'm not alone, that there are millions of people in Belarus and abroad who are supporting our cause. It's Belarusian uh, in uh, different countries, Belarusian diaspora, who are keeping Belarusian agenda. It's our friends in democratic countries who created coalition of countries who are supporting our cause. There's people in the parliaments who created groups for democratic Belarus to support us, to have our voice strengthened. And I realize that I'm not alone. Even if I fall, there will be people who take me up and continue to go with me shoulder to shoulder. So I, I feel the solidarity, I feel the support. Of course, to my opinion, much more could be done, but we... Uh, we Belarusians understand that it's, um, there will be no like, person in the country who will come and save us. This is our duty, our obligation, but we are asking our partners to support us uh, during this fight. So we will, not make, we will not be able to make it alone, uh, but with the, the help of the democratic world, um, people who feel uh, our pain, we will be able to dismantle this regime and uh, save our people and save our independence. President, if I may, um, I'd like to ask a somewhat more hard-nosed question. I'm sure that over the course of your trip to Washington, uh, you've noticed that there is an intense debate going on in this country about America's foreign policy priorities. 
while the case that you've just made uh, is one that's bound to resonate with Americans on moral grounds, uh, and many would express their sympathy for the plight of people of Belarus, there are those who would say uh, that America is faced with hard choices and that anything that uh, distracts the United States from its long-term geopolitical competition with China, whether it's Ukraine, whether it's Belarus, whether it's Europe at large, uh, should be just set aside for the time being. Uh, what would be your best case to uh, Americans, say, you know, Europe skeptic Americans, for why Belarus matters? You know, I honestly think that such powerful countries as uh, America cannot be concentrated on one issue only, on China, for example, because uh, there are countries, you know, who are now fighting for Mm, the same values that uh, Americans cherish. And uh, one more issue is that in front of the nose of powerful countries, you know, dictators are being united and these processes might seem unnoticed until they are too big, you know, and, and, and do too, too strong. And now when we see how dictators are uh, uniting China, Russia, uh, Burson regime, Iran, you know, I think that uh, uh, democratic countries should uh, pay attention to uh, this development because uh, tyranny or dictatorships is like cancer. Until you cut the last cell of this disease, it will spread uh, more and more, and then it will be too late to heal this disease. So uh, I understand that... Uh, Maybe Belarus is not strategic priority at the moment. It's too small, you know, even in comparison with uh, Ukraine, uh, on which uh, the USA is focused at the moment in our region. But we explain to the politicians why uh, Belarus is important in our region, that without free and democratic Belarus, there will be constant threat to uh, Europe, to Ukraine, to uh, other countries, and uh, of course, European Union is a huge ally to uh, the USA, and they can't overlook, you know, the problems that are arising at the moment in in the region, and Belarus shouldn't be overlooked in uh, in regard of this. I guess you're doing the hard questions. I'm going to do the easy questions, but I actually think this is. You, you, your piece in the Wall Street Journal was excellent, um, and I noticed uh, a line that gave me great joy, which was, you wrote, perhaps Mr. Lukashenko didn't believe he could be beaten by a woman. He also said when you were on your campaign, he called you a housewife, which you were. I'm not sure. That's, you should be proud of that. I'm curious. You sit in, in Lithuania. There are powerful women across the region, which is quite amazing, in the Baltic states. You have an incredible leader in Finland as well. You look down at Moldova, a powerful woman as well. When you look at and you think about Lukashenko going after you as a woman, and what is your response to that? How do you, is this just how he was choosing to demean you? Do you think he is also sort of undermining women in Belarus as well? Like when he goes after you and sort of makes these comments about you being a housewife, what's your response? You know, yeah, actually you told that he named me housewife Yes, it didn't offend me because I really uh, was uh, 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 bringing up uh, my children, yeah. you know, before my political career. And uh, I think that Lukashenko was underestimating not only Belarusian women, but all the, like, Belarusian people as nation. You know, he uh, was sure that uh, he's like a strong leader that he's keeping uh, Belarusian, fe Belarusian people in feast and that uh, uh, Belarusians will never dare to challenge him. Because uh, it wasn't uh, the first uprising in the history of our uh, nation, but uh, the previous ones were uh, in less quantity, you know, uh, people also have been detained. Uh, we had political prisoners, I don't know, up to 10 maybe. 
Uh, now the number is about 5,000. So uh, he was sure that he's controlling this, the situation. And uh, why he allowed me to participate in presidential election, he was sure that people will never vote for unexperienced uh, person. And I fully understand him because I also like, look, I, 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 I'm not politician, how can you vote for me? But he did, he did underestimate the mood of Bursan people. He didn't uh, catch uh, that uh, uh, the process of change in Belarusian society. He didn't catch that person. People will vote no f not for wom a woman. They will vote against him. So he was so self-confident that uh, what can this woman do? <laughs> and uh, yeah, he miscal he miscalculated. He lost connection with Belarusian people. You know, for many many years he was somewhere so high above people that he just didn't even look into people's problems. He didn't know how people live. And it was shock for him, of course, to see millions and millions of people on the streets uh, several months in a row. And of course, he used his uh, ordinary instruments uh, such as violence, beatings, tortures to suppress people. But uh, actually 2020 was absolutely different because people really woke up People really felt themselves a single nation, and uh, two and a half years passed, and Lukashenko didn't manage to suppress the will of people, didn't manage to change set of people's minds. You know, yes, people now went underground in their resistance because it's the price for participation for participating in visible uprising is too high. But he knows that as only trigger appears, you know, there will be like blossoming of, of, uh, of resisting again. And actually now he's uh, acting uh, as if hundreds of thousands of people is, is, are standing in front of his palace. He's afraid of peaceful Belarusians. He who has weapon, uh, who ha can use violence, you know, he's afraid of women, pensioners, doctors, even minors, you know, um, because he knows that Belarusian society will never accept him any, anymore. I would just note one quick thing. I think you you don't give yourself enough credit. I think you're doing an incredible job as an incredible leader, and I think it's a, a mark of weak character to underestimate women um, around the world, and we are frequently on the front lines of a lot of democratic fights, so don't underestimate yourself and all of that in, in winning the election. Actually, I, I, I try, but you know, I understood that sometimes, maybe not sometimes, maybe always, women uh, are much... Uh, stronger than uh, they got used to think about themselves. Yes. And when life puts you in obstacles where you have to show your strength, yes. any woman would, would, will do this for her children, for her country, either for, for different reasons. And uh, this internal strength will develop into national resistance. Exactly. So today I'm not totally comfortable with the... Um, Good cop, bad cop <laughs> dynamic that I inadvertently <laughs> set in motion. But I'm going to ask um, a, a twofold question, which is basically a factual one. So, so, so first, I was wondering, Madam President, whether you could help us understand just how much uh, the Lukashenko regime is intertwined with Russia, which is to say, you know, how much autonomy does the Belarusian government really enjoy? particularly in the wake of, of Russia's invasion of, of Ukraine, where Belarus is de facto under, under Russian occupation. And secondly, um, I wonder if you could update us on your successes, failures, uh, state of play when it comes to uh, getting uh, international recognition for, for, the, uh, for the United Transitional Government. Uh, as opposed to, to Lukashenko's regime. I mean, this is a very practical question, has to do with you know, Belarusian assets that are abroad, has to do with your ability to issue passports to Belarusian nationals who are, who are abroad, just you know, where, where you've seen uh, progress on that front and, and what, what your plans are in, in this space, whether it's international organizations or, or, or governments trying to, you know, pushing them to, to just blacklist Lukashenko and talk to you instead as, as the representatives of Belarusian people? Uh, so first of all, I have to say that Lukashenko and Putin, Putin have never been friends. Actually, they have such symbiotic friendship when they 
uh, need each other. They use each other. Uh, when they don't need each other, they could even blackmail each other. Lukashenko always played this uh, seesaw game. When he needs something from Russia, he told, I'll go closer to uh, the Western countries, so, and vice versa. Uh, when back in uh, uh, 2020, you know, we uh, like, like asked actually Russia not to interfere into our internal cause. It wasn't our like geopolitical choice. We told, like explained through media to uh, Russian government that uh, it's not uh, about choosing West or East. It's about dismantling the regime in Belarus. It's our choice. We want uh, another government. We know we we want uh, 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 freedom of speech. You know. I know. Oh, you hear me. Uh, so, but uh, maybe we at that moment uh, underestimated the role that uh, Putin saw in Belarus in his regarding his fu future invasion of uh, Ukraine. He needed Lukashenko, uh, obedient Lukashenko, weak Lukashenko to use him. Uh, you know, as, as puppet uh, in uh, 2022. I suppose that might be maybe uh, this war uh, might start earlier, if not uprising of Belarusian people, and this war couldn't happen at all if Belarusian uprising won uh, uh, this fight. So. Uh, now uh, uh, Lukashenko and Putin again uh, have this like uh, symbiotic like friendship at the moment. Uh, Lukashenko uses Putin as political and economical backup. He is fulfilling all the orders of Putin. Uh, Putin uses uh, Lukashenko as weak partner to use our infrastructure, our soil, our uh, our like uh, land for launching missiles, you know, for uh, possibly deploying nuclear weapon on our territory. And uh, Lukashenko became a full accomplice to Putin in this war, you know, and uh, I think that uh, the only thing Lukashenko is controlling now in Belarus is repressions and violence against people. Now we see this creeping signs of creeping occupation of Russia on our territory in different spheres and military, cultural, education, media. So they are like behaving as they host there with the allowance of Lukashenko. You know, he, he is uh, on the side of uh, Putin against the Belarusian people will. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm often uh, like asked uh, not asked, but some politicians think that uh, uh, Putin puts pressure on Lukashenko for, for Lukashenko to use Belarusian troops against uh, Ukraine and as if uh, Lukashenko resists to this. It's extremely wrong perception. They are on one side, they are full accomplices, they have to share the full responsibility for the war. And the fact that Belarusian army is not participating in this war is uh, thanks to Belarusian people who are, since the very first day of the war, are opposing to uh, Russian aggression. Uh, our uh, military volunteers are fighting shoulder to shoulder with Ukrainians in Ukraine. Our partisans and cyber partisans in uh, Belarus disrupting uh, uh, railways, uh, recently uh, Russian very expensive surveillance um, Airplane was brought up by Belarusian partisans. Our people, knowing that they might face years and years in jail, provide uh, Ukrainians with the information about Russian troops on our territory. So we can't give uh, Ukraine high marks or billions of uh, money, but we are supporting them as much um, as we can. And uh, Lukashenko will be with Putin, you know, uh, till the end. So uh, there is. Uh, uh, Lukashenko tries to pretend that he is peacemaker, that he is like halfly guilty in this war. No, he has to be treated the same as uh, as uh, Putin. And I hope that um, our uh, law system, international law system, will find mechanisms and tools how to bring Lukashenko to accountability. As recently, ICC, ICC, 
uh, made uh, uh, to Putin. You know, because now Lukashenko feels that feels this impunity. You know, he's like somewhere aside, and uh, we uh, have have to let him sink with Russian ship. You know, and as for um, successes and failures of uh, UTC. <clears throat> we uh, created United Transitional Cabinet on the couple about seven months ago as, uh, as answer to the request or demand of person uh, society to unite democratic efforts. Uh, democratic democratically oriented people have never been united have never been so united now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, have never been so united as now. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people, you know, have been, are working in different directions and we just wanted to, um, their jobs not to overlap. And uh, we like created directions of, of uh, work. And, uh, we have uh, six representatives now uh, in the United States Regional Cabinet and, and the uh, task of these representatives is work with all the sect with all the NGOs initiatives that are working in their in a separate sector for example here with us uh, Olga Garbunova uh, she's sitting there she's representative on social issues Olga is uh, ex political prisoner she spent months in the prison, and before she was detained, she, for 20 years she conducted a, a refuge house for, or shelter, shelter for uh, women that were abused by uh, their husbands or the member of family. So now she's dealing with all the NGOs, all the uh, structures that are helping political prisoners, helping uh, women, you know, helping people with uh, uh, special needs. And, uh, uh, you know, when we have been creating this cabinet, some of representatives had already these structures, you know, like, uh, um, uh, like Bipol, I, I'm not sure if you know the structures, some of them ha haven't had anything, and now they are building these structures. And we need assistance to, uh, uh, I mean, financial assistance to our cabinet to hire new people, new specialists uh, to work uh, uh, effectively. For example, a new branch in our cabinet is uh, representative on national revival. We have to understand uh, that uh, we know how, what, what important role national identity works. For many, many years, Russia ruined, and Lukashenko actually ruined our uh, Belarusian features. You know, they uh, closed Belarusian schools. Uh, you know, people overwhelmingly uh, speak in the Russian language instead of Belarusian. And now we have to restore uh, this understanding that we are not Russians, we are Belarusians with our culture, with our history. We have to uh, study to cherish all Belarusians uh, because I'm also the, the, a child of post-Soviet Union space. You know, I, in my family, people uh, speak Russians as Soviet Union people, and the only uh, reason why I can speak uh, Belarusian is thanks to my grandparents who have lived in village and saved uh, this language, and we have to restore uh, this identity. So we pay much attention to uh, this now. And uh, of course, we are looking for recognition of this United of uh, the United Transitional Cabinet in international uh, uh, governments and uh, parliaments. It's a long process. It's uh, but we have to be um, stubborn because we uh, consider ourselves as representative of uh, Belarusian like democratic movement of forces. You, we asking about the recognition of Lukashenko's regime. Uh, most of countries didn't, rec didn't recognize him as uh, uh, president, thanks to them, and we asked them not to communicate with the representatives of the regime. 
but we understand that we have to have like counterparts for uh, for um, democratic countries. That's why we have to institutionalize our relationship and we offer them this alternative. And actually we uh, achieved some concrete steps in, in this direction. Uh, uh, Council of Europe created contact group in uh, uh, the organization not to communicate with the regime but to communicate with democratic forces and I think other organizations can take this as an example uh, and uh, isolate Lukashenko's regime, his cronies, but to uh, build relationship with the uh, representatives of democratic forces because we are sure that the future of our country is with us, with free Belarusians and we have to work for the future now. Such important points, uh, particularly uh, your emphasis on uh, the Belarusian culture and identity as being distinct and separate from the Russian one is very important because not everybody in the West understands that Belarusians historically spend more time in the common state with Poles and Lithuanians than they, than they have with, 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 with the Russians. So now we have time for your questions. Um, if you are watching online, you can still email my colleague Ben Lefkowitz at the email provided in the, uh, on, on, on the web page. If you are in the room, would you like, like to ask a question? Please wait for the microphone. Please introduce yourself and try to formulate your query in the form of a question rather than a statement. We'll start here. Uh, good evening, uh, Madam President. Привет, добрый вечер, как дела? My apologies for the Russian. I don't speak Belarusian, so извините, пожалуйста. I'm Chris Orr, Senior Defense Editor for 1945.com, also a proud donor to both AEI and IRI. Uh, real quick aside, regarding my employer, I recently had two articles published on the Belarusian military, uh, one on the Army, one on the Air Force, and that leads to the crux of my question. Uh, what is your knowledge about the morale and state of readiness of the Belarusian armed forces, their officer corps and enlisted troops alike? Is there any indication of discontent from the ranks that could potentially lead to resistance in case Lukashenko, you know, were to actually join Putin's war effort against Ukraine, whether an outright coup attempt, which you know, sounds like a pipe dream maybe, or at least maybe some sort of large-scale desertions as we're seeing with the uh, Russian conscripts in Ukraine. So, thank you, spasiba, dziakuya, and slava Ukraina. <laughs> Thank you for a fast question. The question was about participation of the moods in our Belarusian army. Yeah? Yes. So, um, you know, our Belarusian soldiers don't percept Ukrainians as in the same way that Russian soldiers percept. We always had good relationship with Ukrainians as nation. We have very similar language. Maybe you even don't know this, that our Ukrainian and Belarusian language is 80% coincide, while uh, Russians don't understand Belarusian language or, or uh, Ukrainian language. So we have a long like, combined history with the Ukrainians, and we absolutely don't have anti-Ukrainian moods in Belarusian society, and the same about army. And when the war uh, has started, uh, of course, it was like a question for us if uh, Belarusian troops will participate, if they are sent. And according to our information, uh, Belarusian regime was about to send uh, Belarusian troops, but like high of officers told that Belarusian army is not ready. They don't want to kill or to be killed on the battlefields of Ukraine for ambitions of two usurpers. And uh, that the Russian army can't trust Belarusian army because uh, if Belarusian army is sent to Ukraine, our soldiers would defect, would change sides, would hide, or would uh, lay down weapon. I don't know how, how it's in English, but not to, uh, uh, not to fight with Ukrainians because we don't have this uh, mood. And <clears throat> uh, that's why, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, uh, Participation of Belarusian troops is under question because it's not merit of Lukashenko, it's merit of Belarusian people. But again, I want to underline that Lukashenko is already full accomplice in this war. And you can't call him like 
like he's not participating, he's like only give his land. Without this, without giving Belarusian land, Bucha wouldn't happen. Millions of, uh, hundreds of thousands of Belarusians wouldn't be killed in the first days and weeks of, uh, uh, of the war. So this blood of Ukrainians on the, heads, on the hands of uh, uh, Lukashenko. So as for uh, internal coup d'etat, you know, uh, of course Lukashenko is afraid of internal coup d'etat that can, might be made not only uh, soldiers but also people who are around him. And to split elites, to split this um, military people, uh, personal security officers, you know, around Lukashenko, we have to show, uh, the world has to show to Lukashenko and we as Belarusian people that there is no future with him, that he's unshakable in the world, that uh, he, uh, his like, leadership is, uh, leads our country to dead end. And the power is with democratic forces. And through uh, uh, strong stance uh, of uh, democratic countries, with uh, having Belarus and uh, democratic forces on diff in different international organizations, you show Lukashenko that he, is, uh, he will never uh, politically revive that he's like, uh, uh, his future is in, uh, in, uh, on trial. And uh, honestly speaking, you know, after uh, each um, declaration about uh, Belarus, each resolution uh, on Belarus, each package of sanctions, each uh, small victory of Ukrainians on the battlefield, we get a lot of signs from inside uh, regime that they would like to collaborate with us, with democratic forces. How can we help you? We would like to be useful. So they like always waiting on whose side power is. And if Lukashenko didn't afraid of this internal betrayal of this coup d'etat, he wouldn't launch this law, new law that allows him to bring um, people from elites and from uh, military sphere to death penalty for uh, state treason. And now everybody in Belarus can be accused in state treason. So he wants to scare uh, people around himself uh, even more. You know, so uh, of course he, and our task, you know, is not to uh, relieve his life. Can I say so? Not to relieve his life, yeah? yeah. But to keep uh, his regime in constant stress, to exhaust him. So uh, I think that, uh, of course, again, uh, I will uh, repeat that we can't do this alone. We uh, have to do our home task, but uh, with the help of um, uh, democratic, powerful countries, it will be much faster and with less victims. I have one question from, from one of our online viewers, uh, from Alan Gabay. Um, given that Lukashenko has so much support from Russia, what leverage does the West really have over him, whether it's through sanctions or otherwise? So, you know, is there a place where Western policymakers could do something where it would really hurt the regime? <clears throat> no, honestly speaking, I, for my very short political career, uh, noticed that uh, democratic countries don't have enough tools or instruments uh, to deal with uh, regimes, with uh, dictators, uh, because the instruments that work in democratic countries uh, don't work with dictatorship, because dictatorship uh, don't uh, respect uh, any international rules. You know, they, uh, they can abuse all the uh, agreements easily. And, uh, but uh, dictators understand only the uh, language of power, of force, and uh, democratic, prosperous, powerful countries can, through uh, economical uh, pressure, through sanctions, you know, make uh, dictatorship, uh, make some concession. And uh, what, is, uh, what regimes are afraid for is unity and consistency. And when, uh, on the example of uh, Belarus, when uh, Lukashenko hijacked Ryanair flight, he was sure that there will be no strong reaction of uh, the West because uh, 
you know, he didn't believe in this unity. When uh, he created, orchestrated migration crisis on the borders, he was, he was sure that he would split opinions of different countries uh, because, you know, some countries, uh, he thought that some will uh, demand from Poland and Lithuania to allow uh, migrants, uh, some will defend uh, the borders uh, because it's, you know, it's a, a big like pain, a, a migration crisis, a big pain for some countries. But uh, a European Union stayed united in this and they managed to... Um, to solve you know, this problem without splitting. Then the war, it's also united Europe and uh, uh, I think it was surprise, maybe shock for uh, Russia and the Belarusian regime. And I really, I'm really proud by the democratic world at the moment they, that they can keep their consistency, they're debating but not quarreling on uh, this issue, issues for the uh, sure Belarusian question unites people, parties, governments, parliaments, you know, and uh, uh, I think that uh, democracy, it's now to, it's time for democracy to show its teeth that uh, you will not be able to split us, uh, we, like, we will stay firm, and only, uh, you know, consistency and unity is power of uh, democracy. Maybe they don't have enough, like, leverage to uh, influence directly, you know, to make uh, uh, dictators act uh, like normally, uh, but through pressure, through isolation, uh, they for sure will manage to, um, to change behavior of dictators. On that cautiously optimistic note, I, I suspect we have to wrap this up. Yes. I want to thank everybody who has joined us. I want yes. to thank Antonia and the wonderful IRI team for teaming up with us. And most importantly, I want to thank uh, Svetlana Tsikhanouskaya for gracing us with her presence. Thank you so much. Thank you. For the Thank you for the